Hi, everyone. We're going to wait just one minute, one minute for the audience to log into Zoom, and then we will get started at 9.01. All right, I think we have a critical mass, so let's go. Good morning or good evening, wherever you may be watching. Welcome to today's webinar, The Implications of the Chinland Council for Myanmar's Resistance in 2024. I'm Pam Kennedy, a research analyst with Stimson's East Asia program. And today I'm joined by Zotun Mung, the executive director of the Chin Association of Maryland, and John Indergaard, the advocacy and project coordinator at the Chin Association. Zo and John recently wrote about the formation of the Chinlun Council in Myanmar this past December, and we will put the link to the article in the chat for the audience to review. Um, the Chinlun Council is only the second time during the coup that one of the ethnic minority groups of Myanmar has attempted to organize a new state structure, and it's the first to incorporate members of the parliament elected during Myanmar's last free election in late 2020. So today we're going to discuss what this development in Chin State means for the resistance, what it can reveal about the dynamics within and among Myanmar's many ethnic minorities, and what it could mean for the future of center state relations in Myanmar. So first I will ask Zo to share his thoughts and then John will weigh in. I'll pitch the first question to John, then we'll move into the Q&A discussion. So if you would like to submit a question, please send it through the Q&A function in Zoom. Zo, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for inviting us uh, today. And uh, the timing is very, very good. Uh, the first Chinlin conference was held in early December, uh, establishing an interim Chinlin constitution and the Chinlin Council. Just yesterday, the Chinlin Council filled its main role and responsibilities and formed the Chinlin government. I will begin with some background about Chin State. Chin State is uh, diverse, uh, even for Burma. The Chin people include dozens of different tribal and local groups speaking different dialects. The language might be different from one hill, hilltop to the next. In general, the three centers of political power after the coup are the Chin National Front, the Chinland Defense Forces or CDFs, and the members of parliament, um, the C CNF is the veteran and the revolutionary organization and took a leadership role in preparing the Chin people for armed resistance. The Chinland Defense Forces or CDFs are similar to the PDFs established across Burma after the coup. Most were originally protesters or CDMs, civil uh, disobedience movement, they went underground to form armed resistance groups after the military attacked the, protector, the protesters. The CDFs are decentralized due to the local and differences in Chin State. There are at least 17 CDFs um, in, in uh, recognized in the Chilean Council framework. 
and they are responsible for local administrations in the liberated areas uh, such as health, uh, education, and humanitarian assist, even judiciary. Um, and most chain resistant fighters are CBF members. Chin State is also unique uh, because the majorities, the majority of MPs uh, elected in 2020 avoided capture and remain active in the resistance. So the Chinlin Council uh, claims to represent about 80% of Chin State, uh, the CNF, most of the CDFs, and uh, 17 out of uh, 27 MPs. Uh, there are uh, three main CDFs which uh, currently refuse to participate in the uh, Chinlin Council or in the Chinlin government. The Chin National Organization, also known as uh, Chin National Defense Force, based in Flam Township, um, CDF Mindat and Zomi Federal Union or PDF Zolan, uh, they form recently a separate uh, Chin Brotherhood, although negotiations among the um, uh, Chinland Council uh, and these groups uh, continue. Mm -hmm. Um, and John will talk uh, more about uh, the implications. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the formation of the Chinland Council and Chinland government might have both national and international implications. So at first, as Pam said, it's the second serious attempt to establish a statewide governing body in the resistance. The first being the Kareni State Interim Executive Council in a Kaya state. So the Chinlin government could potentially be another model or provide more lessons for areas with especially diverse populations to establish self-governance. And in particular, the way that it includes and represents the CDFs as the on the ground presence and the way that it includes uh, civilian leadership alongside the, the leaders of the armies makes it important. Uh, second, with most major Chin resistance forces now united under a defense ministry, there are hopes for further successes on the battlefield. So since Operation 1027 began last year, Chin forces have also had a string of successes taking over towns and junta outposts across the state. So right now, most of the countryside is under resistance control, while the junta continues to control township capitals such as Hakka, Flam, Mindad. Uh, which brings us to international impact. India has been hedging ever since the 2021 military coup um, with Chin State right on the border with India's Mizoram state. Um, they've hesitated to support pro-democracy forces and kept up engagement with the Burmese military. So one thing that gets talked about a lot is that since November, a total of 700 junta troops have run across the border away from battles with resistance forces to India, and they've been repatriated back to um, Burma. So India's policy towards Burma is driven in part by fears of border insecurity and the desire to protect investments in the Kaladan project, which is supposed to connect Northeast India with the Indian Ocean through Chin State uh, and Arakan State. But with nearly the entire Indo-Burma border in the state under resistance control now, and Chin forces working to create a single authority, uh, we think the Chinlin government might present itself as a more dependable partner for India. Um, uh, I would like to add more about that. <clears throat> the the Chinlin constitution says that the council will work with the NUG, NUCC, and other federal units. So uh, yesterday, the government has for, uh, was formed, and uh, it has 15 ministries, including a foreign and defense ministry for the revolutionary period. Uh, the government is now led by Chief Minister Pu Pa Thang, uh, a member of parliament from Matipi Township. 
Bupa uh, Tang is uh, also the leader of the Chin MPs, uh, active in the resistance, also known as CRCH. And uh, the next two positions, Foreign Minister and Defense Minister, are, are from the CNF. Um, <clears throat> And the Home Minister, uh, Bu Robin, is from the CDF, uh, Zhou Pei. And uh, the rest of the ministerial uh, roles are split up in a similar way uh, between all three groups. Um, uh, there are two women in the cabinet. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Saron Par from the Hakka CDF as Minister of Health and Sports and B. Nisulian, uh, a Tantlang Member of Parliament uh, as Minister for Children and uh, Women. Uh, this is uh, quite, quite significant. And the, uh, the role of the Council, the Chinlan Council, uh, uh, one of uh, the role of the Chinlan Council is to form further strategies for establishing Chinlan, provide advice to the government, the Chinlan government. So it has advisory role. And then uh, the Chilean Council also has the authority to decrease or increase the number of ministerial positions as needed. So most importantly, the council uh, shall be tasked with um, um, three, three points. One, <clears throat> forming an election commission. Two, a plan for the transitional period uh, after the uh, May Online uh, and, and SAC uh, are beaten. And then, uh, and topple down, and the third one is organizing a public conference, a Chin public conference to write and adopt a permanent constitution. So the current uh, one is uh, for the interim period only during the revolutionary period, but <clears throat> the council uh, uh, will, 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 will hold a public conference uh, to adopt the, the permanent constitution. I think this, this is a quite, quite important. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both for that wonderful introduction to the Chinlin Council and for describing the situation on the ground um, in Chin State as well. It's, my first question to John will help us further get a sense of the lay of the land. Can you tell us more about the relationship between the Chinlin Council and the National Unity Government? Like, How does the Chin's new political structure benefit the resistance more broadly? Um, thank you for the question. In, in general, I would say that the two groups are complementary even if the relationship is not entirely mm -hmm. formalized. And uh, the Chinlin constitution, uh, as Zoe said, is considered a revolutionary or interim document. So it doesn't say exactly how things will look in post-war Burma, but there's a lot of language about federal democracy. And the council says one of its main goals is establishing a federal union. Um, the council does explicitly state that Chinlin will work with the NUG with the National Unity Consultative Council, and as Zoe mentioned, other federal units throughout the revolution. And that, that phrase is taken to refer to the ethnic revolutionary organizations in other states. So it's a mandate for coordination between Chinland and resistance forces uh, across the country. Um, and I think it's especially important to note, even if it's, it's not formal uh, legal ties um, laid out explicitly that there are these institutional ties running throughout the Chinlin government and NUG and personal ties. So the Chin National Front is a key stakeholder in the Chinlin government, as well as in the National Unity government. So you can see that, well, you can see that in the joint position statement that they released uh, yesterday, actually, the NUG along with the Chin National Front, Karen National <laughs> Union, and uh, uh, KNPP. Um, and I would also mention Lian Sakong, a uh, CNF vice chair, currently holds a ministerial position in the NUG. So th these are already pretty enmeshed. Um, and aside from the CNF, 
the MPs in the Chinlin government also have national ties. I think they were all elected yes. as uh, <laughs> members of the National League for Democracy. So this makes us hopeful that the future trend will be towards unity. Um, as for the political structure benefiting the resistance, um, there are both military and political implications, as we said. In theory, uniting these dozen plus Chin resistance groups with a, one defense ministry should make them more coherent and effective military partner for the NUG, though this still needs to be proven. And politically, as I said, if the Chinlin government proves to be an effective way of properly representing this whole diverse population, then there will be lessons for the national level. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, in your article, you you both wrote about and you discussed today how um, uh, the Chin people, when asked about the future of Chin state, they, they are focused on the interim, the revolutionary period, defeating the junta and what comes after that uh, will be the next step. But in the future, how does Chin state see its relationship with a central government evolving and could um could it be a new vision for a new national constitution um you know the government chinan government was formed yesterday and uh the, the council uh, was also uh, formed recently and uh, as, as you you could see in our article our analysis it entirely based on the constitution, the Chinan constitution. So um, in the future, I think um, it will be uh, too, too, too early to, to predict okay, uh, what will happen in the future. Uh, but um, there, there are clear, uh, I think, revisions in, 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 in the areas outlined in the Chinan constitution. Okay. Um, related to the state and the center, okay. Um, for, for example, uh, one of the most uh, important uh, area is natural resource governance. Okay, so natural resource governance. Uh, uh, Article 11 and 12 of the constitution claim ownership of the state lands and natural resources um, which used to be controlled uh, from a navy door. Uh, I, I think uh, this is uh, a quite uh, unique not only in the context of Chin state. So how about gas in Arakan state, natural gas? How about jade, jade, J-A-D-E in Chin state? How other natural resources? Uh, in, in even in Karenni state or Kaya state. So, so um, uh, I, 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 I think uh, uh, these uh, uh, revisions uh, uh, about natural resources governance or land ownership, uh, these are one of uh, the political crises that we have been facing in, in, in Burma. Thank you. you. You raise a really good point that along with um, giving greater autonomy to the ethnic states of Myanmar would go hand in hand with giving them more power to control their natural resources and to improve their own economies rather than um, improving the national economy at, the, at their expense. Um, that is a, an excellent point. I will go to the Q&A that we're getting from the audience. The questions are starting to come in. If you would like to ask a question as a reminder, you can put it in the question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So our, our first question from Mogyo is about the Chinland Brotherhood Alliance. They released a statement saying that the Chinland Council Conference did not adhere to democratic standards, lacked equality, failed to represent and reflect the unity of the entire Chin ethnic group. How do you respond to that statement? And what, what does that mean for um, the 
the future of Chin State with this sort of like holdout groups, the, the fractured nature of this diverse state? The numbers. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I just have to take a second to organize my thoughts a little. Okay. Sure. So the Chinland Council is didn't come out of nowhere. It's basically been the result of almost three years of negotiations since the military coup. And there have been different iterations or um, versions of this that have tried to be established. So I think there were two groups in particular. There had been a, a interim Chin National Consultative Committee, which was formed after the coup, which represented all of these, um, all of these armed groups, the CNF, MPs, and civil society members as well. And that was tasked originally with forming a Chinlin Council, eventually working towards a state government, and the process, um, it, it didn't go all the way, it, it fell apart um, with the Chin National Front withdrawing. So I think the Brotherhood has said that the Chin National Front withdrawing from older attempts to form the, gov the government and kind of forging their own way has been um, against democratic norms. And I think that's been their main sticking point. Um, that being said, um, with the uh, Chinland conference, um, all of the CDFs were invited, all of the MPs were invited. And uh, we, I would say that the three organizations that hold out that form the Brotherhood Alliance declined to attend as, as a protest. Um, so I think there was, there was an opportunity for inclusion there and the talks are ongoing and this is something they're going to have to work out. But I would make the point again that th it does represent the vast majority of Chin State's resistance, even if it, the, you know, the procedure was not um, up to what everyone wants, perhaps. Or um, I think one other thing I would say is that um, even in, let's say, Falam Township, where the Chin National Organization has its base, that doesn't mean that all of Falam Township is excluded from the Chinland government, because other groups in Falam Township did join on. And as for how persistent this rift might be, we're, we're hoping that um, due to essentially everyone knowing each other, mm -hmm. and there being many personal ties between the leadership here, and of course, some of the MPs who didn't join the, the conference, well, they, they all know each other. They're all from the National League for Democracy. So we're hopeful that they can work something out eventually. Thank you. Thank you. And we had a similar question come in um, from Michael Martin that the interim Chin National Consultative Council also announced the formation of the Chin People's Administrative Committee, so possibly a rival interim government. And I think that what you say in your answer really does offer a lot of lessons and food for thought, not just for the other ethnic states of Myanmar, but also the resistance as a whole. It will be necessary at some point to reconcile differences, to negotiate and compromise, um, and find a way forward that suits most people, at, while at the same time providing the services needed for um, a state for everyone. Uh, what are your thoughts on how we can take the lessons from this process in Chin State and apply it in that broader context? Is there is there like a key takeaway for the rest of Myanmar? Okay, uh, okay. Pam, can you please repeat the question? Yes, of course. So my question in a, in a nutshell is, we're learning a lot about the process of negotiating within the Chin ethnic group from this, from the Chinland Council, from the holdout groups, the Brotherhood Alliance, the ICNCC. And um, I think that there, there's probably a lesson there that the resistance as a whole could learn um, because eventually when the junta is defeated, the resistance will also 
need to negotiate and find a path forward, even though there will be diff- disagreements. What are your thoughts on that? Um, as John uh, mentioned, uh, the negotiations continues. So among among them, and everyone knows, you know, we have common cause and and uh, common uh, uh, position, which is to topple down uh, the military regime and establish uh, a federal democratic union in, in Burma. So, um, you know, both sides uh, 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 talking. I hope uh, they will continue um, negotiations again. So uh, I think uh, it it will be okay. <laughs> not not tomorrow. May not be tomorrow. Uh, but uh, um, uh, I think it will be fine. Um, could I add to that? Sure. If I recall correctly, the Chinlin Constitution does still um, recognize the the groups that didn't join, or at least. There, there are a certain number of, let's say, um, CDF or township slots for representation. Not every every one of them has been filled. So I think they're consciously keeping some institutional space open for if these groups eventually join. Um, same thing with the yeah. MPs who are, they're hoping will be part of the parliament at some point. Thank you. And I, I want to take another question that digs further into what the Chinline Council might be doing in the future. Um, Cameron Bean asks, um, it says that it was mentioned that the Chinline Council will work on establishing an election commission. Um, So how does the Chinline Council plan to get in from its constituents and ensure that inclusion in the electoral process. Of course, this it's very early days with the state just formed yesterday, but any thoughts you can offer would be very interesting. Oh, thank you. Like I said, I don't think we know too much about the nitty gritty of this sort of process and of course, in Chin State, though a lot of the countryside is under resistance control, the a lot of the big towns and the the um, township capitals like Mindat or Matupi are still under junta control. So that's huge, you know large populations that wouldn't be represented if they went ahead with elections right away. So we don't know exactly how things are going to look. It, it will probably depend on the situation on the ground. Yeah. Um... Uh, I, I might add the the this is uh, uh, about the Chin Chilean government. So the Chilean government's term is for two years. So after two years, there will be election, and in order to uh, elect the the Chin the Chilean government, then the the council uh, has uh, the. The, the the authority to form the election commission. So this refers to the Chinlen constitution. Thank you. Let's turn to sort of the 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 foreign relations of Chin State. I think it's very interesting that the Chinlen Council has formed a defense ministry and a foreign affairs ministry, which normally are executive functions of government. But for Chin State, it's very important because of the border with India and Mizoram State to maintain some sort of ability to handle that relationship. Um, Orlando Craig asks um, about this relationship with India. He asks, um, you highlighted India's economic and security interests along the border. And historically, India has supported the junta for stability on that border. And now there are indications that India may secure the border. So given the Chinland Council developments, is the Chinland Council in contact with officials in India? And are there any signs that you see that India may change its policy uh, away from supporting the junta? What would you look for as an indicator? Oh, thank you. That, that's a lot of parts of that question. And I'll try to 
we'll try to get to everything at one point. Um, we we strongly suspect that the Chinland government is in the process of reaching out to the Indian government, um, and they're making that their priority with uh, foreign relations. As for um, the issue of border sec um, security, it's it's long been the case that groups in Northeast India, uh, let's say in, in Manipur, are able to get safe haven in parts of Sakang region. And I, th I think the traditional view has been that the Indian government has to work with the Burmese military to control that border because, well, that's what, what you do. You work with the other government, you work with the other military. But in, in reality, there, there's been a something of a tacit understanding between the junta and these Indian insurgent groups in the hinterland, they are, are not exactly making them the priority. They're much more focused on the resistance forces. And in some cases, these insurgent groups have actually been fighting against um, resistance forces. So we, we think the traditional view of, of the Burmese military as a good security partner for the border is outdated if ever there was logic to it. Um, as for the direction we think things might be going in Mizoram and at the central government level in India, well, th th it's been a mixed message of sorts because, um, I, I, as you might have heard recently, the free movement regime is on the uh, central government may be planning to uh, suspend or withdraw from the free movement regime, put up a border fence to make this border um, less accessible for any anybody going across it, including from Chin State. So that would be something we tend to think um, works against the resistance. But at the same time, in Mizoram State, which has very close ties to the Chin people, um, the new state government there has been redoubling efforts to advocate in favor of the Chin, in favor of refugees, in favor of the resistance with the central government. And I, I think Zoe could talk mm -hmm. more about that yeah. personal <clears throat> diplomacy. Um, I, I, I think we need to look at the, the mind and the heart of the Mizo people, especially the civil society groups and uh, religious groups. Uh, religious group, I mean, uh, like uh, Christians. And then civil society group, uh, especially Center Young Mizo Association and MZP Mizo Student Union, Mizo Zero Life Ball, they have opposed the border fencing. Um, I, I think it will be quite tough uh, from, from, from uh, New Delhi uh, to oppose the, the people of uh, Mizoram uh, related to this border fencing. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, the center uh, will not impose uh, their will against the will of the Mizo people. This is not only about the resistance against the military regime in Burma. It's about the relations uh, between the two people uh, who are in India, Mizoram state, and who are in uh, Chin state. So we are uh, uh, brothers and sisters uh, before the, the British uh, invasion. Um, could I add one more thing? Sure. And I, I haven't been able to verify this, but there have been reports that the Assam rifles in India, the sort of paramilitary group controlled by the Indian government that helps um, on border security. There's been some reports that they went over to Rikadar on the border with Chin State um, and recently captured by the resistance. So I think if, if you saw engagement between border security forces, for example, that might be indicative of at least a de facto shift in policy. But that, that's not something I can talk about with uh, any more assurance than that. Yeah, well, we do not know the intention of, of that visit uh, of the Assam rifle to, to yeah, that, that yeah. area. 
Um, in uh, the, the recent uh, visit by the Mizoram Chief Minister Laldu Omar to New Delhi uh, was also encouraging. Uh, he, in the, he, the Chief Minister Laldu Omar said that he invited the uh, Union Foreign uh, External Affairs Minister to visit uh, Mizoram and then uh, he, he plans to take the foreign, the external affairs minister uh, to the refugee camp. So um, uh, there are, yes, uh, good, good signs uh, uh, coming uh, out, but, but let, let's see. Oh, and, and one mm -hmm. final thing that the Home Minister Amit Shah right. made a statement that um, until the situation in Burma has returned to normalcy, the center will not deport any of the refugees which is, is a pretty big yeah, uh, shift. Th 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 thank you, John, uh, yeah. pointing out that I think uh, that's a really, really a shift uh, in policy because uh, previously the, uh, the same government, the BJP government was not quite, uh, how, how to say, <laughs> uh, supportive of the situation, but I think, yes, that, that's a big, a big shift. Thank you. Thank you. There, there are a lot of developments, it's clear, yeah. between Mizoram state and the central government in, in India. It sort of mirrors the situation, I think, a little bit for these peripheral peoples to get more agency and be able to control their border relations. And you also covered a, a question from Surab Sen, um, writing in from Kolkata, on how the, the change in the Mizoram state government impacted India's position on Chinlan. So thank you. Um, I want to turn to sort of the internal relations. Um, we have a question also from Saurabh Sen about the engagement between the Chin State Defense Forces and the Arakan Army. What can you tell us about um, that relationship? Sure. Uh, just a second. Um, th this isn't something I think we, we can talk about too much, but it's worth noting that Palewa, where the Arakan army recently took over the township capital and they're reported to control the whole state. Well, at the same time, there are still some Chin resistance groups in the area. Um, I think just within the last day or two, they'd captured a group of Junta soldiers. Um, so I think... I think it's been the practice generally that they're, they're trying to avoid conflicts. That's the policy. But in, in practice, there have been, you know, incidents, I think, where Arakan army, in one case, arrested some people from a Chin resistance group. So it, it's, it seems fairly messy on the ground, but the policy is one of collaboration. Um, uh, I'm, I might add, um, you know, AA Arakan army, has uh, taken the, the army post recently, which is really, really encouraging because as you know, Arakan army is not <clears throat> um, attacking the military only in Chin state or Arakan state. They are participating in even not in Xi'an state. So, um, and, and again, the, the, for us, for everyone, the resistant groups, uh, the goal is to topple down this military regime. Uh, even within the Chin state or <clears throat> in, 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 in Burma. Um, so, so we are very happy to see the new development uh, in Western Burma as well, uh, where the, the North and the South are um, um, taking um, more posts, which are encouraging. I think now the West and the Northwestern are doing that, which is really, really good. And then uh, in, in terms of chins in Arakan, there are thousands of chins in Arakan state. Yes, there are thousands of uh, 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 Arakans in Chin state and we are borders. We are our neighbors. <laughs> so we, we are really, really good neighbors each other. 
Thank you. You, you mentioned um, the Arakan Army taking Palewa Township in um, Chin State, and that made me think, what are the Chinlun Council and Chin Resistance views on the developments since Operation 1027, which the Arakan Army played a large role in? What, what are um, Chin perspectives on that operation? Well, I would start by saying, I think that not long after um, Operation 1027 started, the Chin National Front and Army were saying, well, we want to join the offensive. And right at the beginning of November, you saw the first of a rash of, um, of uh, takeovers of towns like Rikadar on the border that are very important. So, um, Officially, the, the Chin groups are saying they are, are working along with Operation 1027. And of course, these things don't come out of nowhere. There needs to be um, planning very far ahead of time for these attacks on towns and things like that. So um, I, I think the Chin do see themselves as pretty connected or invested oh, in the oh, national struggle. Oh, oh, yes, uh, not only in the now, uh, the North also in the South. Uh, for example, CNF is uh, a member of K3C. So, so K3C includes the Kachin and the Grand and the Granny. Yes, uh, the Chins are pretty much uh, involved uh, in the North and the South as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'll expand that as well um, out of the purely defense dimension. We have a question from Christina Fink about the role of Chin religious leaders in Chin politics over the past three years. I want to expand on that to include um, civil society in general, not just within the past three years, but especially within the past six months when we, we've seen so much progress, both on um, the resistance, but also these new political developments. What are your thoughts about religion, religious leaders and civil society leaders in Chin State and the roles they have played. You go, you go. Yeah, I, I think, think no, 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 you, you talk go, to please. the pastors all no, the time. Please, no, oh. I, I, <laughs> Okay, well, uh, that, that is a very good question. And again, it, it seems like there are many parts to it. Chin State, I, I think we should just stay, say for the, the record, um, in case people in the audience don't know, is um, very much majority Christian. Um, what what percent would you say? So eighty yeah. five. Yeah, eighty five. But in in the north, uh, almost uh, 96, 97 percent. Mm -hmm. So the the religious leaders have very much been leading the um, humanitarian response and help for IDPs and. I think since the coup have become more and more central in the civil society in Chin State, and of course the in in the refugee situation in Mizoram State, also religious leaders are incredibly important for um, continuing to help refugees and then um, making connections with the the Mizo, keeping the community community bound strong. Um, as for civil society more broadly, well, of course, there's the humanitarian role and um, as well as documenting atrocities, groups like the uh, Chin Human Rights Organization have been especially key for um, making the military's crimes better known, better documented. Um, I, I would note that the ICNCC, which was the, um, well, it's, it's, I, uh, the older, attempt to form a Chinland council in the government that's still going now with a parallel track, they did explicitly include civil society, whereas uh, the, the current Chinland council, Chinland government, uh, don't have that formal recognition. Is, is that correct? Yeah, and then uh, uh, at the same time, ICNCC did not include CDFs and CDM. So mm -hmm. anyhow, um, since the coup, the military has uh, um, killed pastors, uh, imprisoned pastors, and uh, destroyed and bonding the churches, bombing the churches, 
and we came has been documenting on that and even the day before yesterday we released our latest report on, on the prosecutions of christian in in burma and uh for example in tantang tang um there there are uh, 22 churches including the baptist the presbyterian the catholic the methodist and the pentecostal churches out of 22 churches, uh, 20, 21 have been destroyed or burned down. And the entire population of Tantlang, about 10,000, have been displaced. And some of them have been taking refuge in Mizoram state. And, uh, and then this happened in other townships as well, of course, in Matupi, Mindat, Falamitidi, and other areas. Uh, in parts of Chin State. And there are about uh, 70,000 Chin here in the US. Uh, they form alliance and association, for example, Chin Baptist Churches of USA. Uh, and then another one is Chin um, Association of North America. And there are, there are, there are a couple of uh, uh, associations and, and they are quite quite active in terms of delivering humanitarian assistance even providing some informal advice uh, to, to the resistance groups and in other parts of the the world uh, there are also um, chain groups in Australia Asia and New Zealand and then in Canada and Europe um, in Norway and Denmark Switzerland um, so, so uh, the these uh, diaspora groups in Chins are very, very active in terms of uh, providing humanitarian assistance, and at the same time, uh, some kind of uh, informal uh, consultation or advice to 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 the resistance groups. And to that, I would add. Um, a lot of these Chin Baptist and religious groups are working with Baptists in the United States right. and forming advocacy groups with Congress and have been reaching out to, let's say, get the Burma Act passed mm -hmm. and to um, make sure that Burma funding is included in appropriations, things like that. So there, that's been pretty much constant. And a lot of our day-to-day -day right, is working right. with these Baptist groups right. that are and, doing and advocacy. Yeah, in addition to that's good point. In addition to the Chin groups, there is also uh, an umbrella uh, group called Burma Advocacy Group (BAG), which is comprised with the Chins and the Garans and the Kachins and the Grani and even the Brahmins. So there is uh, an umbrella organization uh, uh, known as BAC. Uh, we're going to have a prayer service tomorrow in Washington, D.C., and then we're going to protest in front of the White House from uh, 1 to 4 in the afternoon here in Washington, D.C. Thank you. you. You raised some very good points there about the role of these religious leaders and um, in civil society in um, bringing together like the power of the Burmese diaspora um abroad to support the resistance against the junta and i'm curious what the relationship is between these groups and the other states of myanmar you mentioned the burma advocacy group of course brings together many uh, ethnic minorities the situation on the ground though we we often when we're when we're studying Myanmar's resistance, we're, we're often looking at the relationships between different defense forces, different armies of the, the EAOs, EROs. What are the relationships among civil society and the religious groups? And do you see those as being key for the resistance developing um, more unity and making more progress? Um. The taking a, an example um, of BAG, Burma Advocacy Group. So the Burma Advocacy Group is comprised uh, of both religious and community organizations. Uh, for, for, for example, uh, Kachin Baptist Churches of, uh, of USA and then Kachin Alliance. 
and then uh, Kachin Baptist, uh, Korean Baptist churches of USA and Korean uh, communities here in the US, Chin Baptist churches of USA, Chin community, uh, Chin Association Maryland, and Chin community. So this is comprised with both religious and uh, community organization, which is very, very helpful. And then tomorrow at, at the event, um, the, uh, the acting president, uh, Duala Sila will be speaking. And then Dr. Sasa also will be speaking. So there is uh, connections. And, and, and then again, not, not, uh, not only the, the, the Chins or the Karens uh, or, or others from Burma. So uh, there will be others here in the US, such as American Baptist Churches USA. Um, um, they will be also uh, joining the, the event tomorrow. And, and uh, for our event, uh, the, con the mm. congressional briefing the other day, <clears throat> the, the Catholics, uh, USCCB, uh, uh, the Catholics, uh, the, the Department of Justice in International uh, uh, Peace also co-sponsored our event. So it's beyond the Baptists, now the Catholics. And then we plan to reach out to others as well, Presbyterian National Council of Churches. And, and then the Methodists, and then the Southern Baptist. So, so our coalition is 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 more broadening. Uh, so uh, we we are coming together now. Um, important. I think I'd like to note that at the International Religious Freedom Summit a few days ago here in DC, um, we had a panel with a couple of Chin youth, as uh -huh. well as. Uh, Lucky Karim, the Rohingya activist, right. and uh, Ong Chao Mo, the mm -hmm. deputy minister um, for human rights in the NUG, who's also a Rohingya. So we'd definitely like to see more of this inter-community engagement going forward. Yeah, uh, there, there, there were four panelists. Uh, two of them are Chins, and then another, one, another two are Rohingyas. Yeah. Thank you. So I will circle back. We just have a little bit of time before the top of the hour. And unfortunately, there are a lot of open questions. So I will try to combine some. We have a question about the possibility of unity between the Chinlin Council and the Interim Chin Consultative Council. Um, what do you see as being the path forward for building more um, unity among the Chin, the, the the differing tracks, the parallel tracks, as you say, John, for different political structures. Um, and we have another question noting that there are concerns by the Chin Civic Movement with what the split could mean for um, the interim period. Um, <laughs> uh, that, that's a good question, but uh, uh, personally, I know both sides very, very well. And, and uh, we are in very important uh, and critical situation. Uh, we know that our struggle is to topple down the military regime, and then as well as you know establish the federal democratic union. And especially in the Chin context, this day, this tomato has destroyed our churches, they imprison our pastors. And, and so everyone knows we have to come together. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried at all, I'm not concerned at all. The good thing is the talks continues. And, and I'm not concerned at all. Um, there will be one way or the other um, to, to, to work together. And, and everyone knows that we have a common cause. We have come together, not only in the chains, we have to work together. It's really, really good that there is a good coordination, cooperation among the, the Northern groups. Uh, and, and it's good that now in the whole country, the NGG, NGCC, everyone comes together. We have to come together. And unless we have to cooperate each other more, we won't defeat this terminal. 
So, so uh, my, my message, oh no, I'm not worried. I'm not worried at all because both leaders know our cause very, very well. The talks continues, uh, it, it will be fine, but it may not be fine tomorrow, but definitely um, um, it, it will be fine. John, anything you would like to add to that? Well, I, I don't have the same sort of insider perspective as so does. I, I think I would just note the ICNCC. They also say they're going to cooperate with the NUG. Is that right? So, yes. Yeah. So, well, one way or the other, um, there is still coordination. Nobody's um, going completely the other way. And um, I, I think it's it's competitive or there's a rivalry, but it's pretty bounded. That's, that's the way I see it, at least. Thank you. And I will ask just one last question in our last four, three, four minutes. Um, if you had the chance, based on your analysis, based on your, your deep perspectives on the dynamics within Shin State, if you could offer one piece of advice or based on the Chinlin Council development experience to other ethnic states in Myanmar, um, what would that be? Go ahead, John. Well, uh, I, I just simply don't feel qualified to do that myself. I, I'm sorry, I, I just, just don't. <laughs> that, that's quite all right. And maybe I shouldn't phrase it as like advice because every ethnic state is different. A, a The main lesson that the process of developing Chinlin Council has has developed, perhaps. I I I think um, uh, looking at the constitution, uh, even though this is uh, interim constitution, and then this this is for revolutionary period, and then the council uh, and others uh, will 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 think through and then write a new constitution. Uh, but uh, looking at the constitution for this revolutionary period, I think this is really uh, a good constitution bringing all uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, the members of parliament, and then CDFs, uh, and then the veterinarian CNF are coming together. Um, I, uh, and I think I think that, that, that this is really uh, a good start. Uh, in in this way, if we could come all together, I mean the south and the north uh, and other regions. Uh, I, uh, I think the more we get united, the more uh, we get the strength. And um, I think the Tamadol me all high is in ICU now you know, intensive care unit. So, so will they fit. Thank you very much. Well, we have reached the top of the hour. Um, thank you, Zoe and John, for um, offering your perspective as you've really deepened the discussion um, in the analysis on your paper today. And I really appreciate you taking the time to answer all these questions in such great detail. Um, thank you also to our audience um, for asking such ex excellent questions, and um, I hope you all take the time to read Zoe and John's paper on the Stimson website. The link again is in the chat. So 